Hello, I am Professor John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. This video is the third in a series on Ford hybrid vehicles. Specifically the 2013 through 2016 Ford Fusion Hybrid. We, in the previous videos we looked at the battery, the high voltage battery that I have on the table back here behind us. Uh, we looked at the inverter assembly and the three phase cables that connect to the HF35 transaxle, the Ford hybrid transaxle that's used in the Fusion hybrid, the Fusion Energy, the plug-in uh, hybrid, the C-Max uh, hybrid and, and C-Max uh, plug-in. And this transaxle is a newer design of two previous generation transaxles that Ford used in their hybrid vehicles uh, like the Escape uh, since 2005. Uh, there were two earlier versions and I have a separate video on comparing all three generations of the Ford hybrid transaxles. Uh, so this one, once again, 2013 through 2016. For 2017 there's some changes and we'll talk about those here in a little bit. But they all basically work the same way and this video I want to talk more about the electrical operation of the transaxle than the mechanical operation. As I said I, I already have a video on the mechanical operation of this transaxle uh, and you can click on the link to see that. But what we want to do is figure out how does this work electrically? What does the inverter, the TCM, the transmission control module, uh, do to control the transmission and how does it how does it do it what what do these two orange cables do that plug into the side of the the transaxle okay these three phase cables these two three phase cables on the transaxle come and plug in right here where these plugs these green plugs are shipping plugs if you look closely here at these open connector ends on the transaxle. You can see the three bolt holes where the cable housing would bolt up and then you can see the three electrical terminals where the connector would plug in and complete the electrical circuit. The inverter assembly sits right above the transaxle in the vehicle and so these cables just come right down below and plug in. All right, let's look at what else is here on this transaxle besides the three phase electrical connectors. Uh, this particular transaxle, although it's the same model, the HF35, that would go in the Fusion Hybrid and a C-Max Hybrid, this particular version is for the Fusion Energy and the, and the C-Max Energy, the plug-in hybrids. And how do I know? Well, right here on the driver's side of the case is an auxiliary electric oil pump. So when we are in electric vehicle mode with the internal combustion engine off, we do not have the internal combustion engine driving the oil pump internally. There's a mechanical oil pump inside of here. That's only driven uh, off of the engine. So when the engine is off in electric vehicle mode, we need an electric oil pump to circulate fluid throughout the transmission to lubricate our power split device, planetary gear set, all the bearings, gears, uh, and so on. And very important also, the cooling of the stator assemblies because they get really, really hot uh, driving the vehicle down the road. Okay, so we've got an external cooler. There's some cooler lines. This pulls the fluid from the bottom of the uh, transmission and then pumps it over and up into, and you can see some of these casting fluid passages here for lubrication and, and stator cooling, as I mentioned before. Now, as a side note, for you Ford fans, you, you may find this humorous. Uh, the 2016 Toyota Prius and the Prius Prime use a transaxle very, very similar to this, a parallel axis transaxle. So we've got the motor generator right here that starts the internal combustion engine and generates electrical power that is fed back through that inverter we just moved 
changed back to DC from AC and then charges the high voltage uh, battery. And then right here, up in the, this upper corner, uh, we have the traction motor. And this is motor is the one that when it rotates, it moves the vehicle down the road. Well, if you look on the, the bench right behind me, on the left, you can see the same housing that we just looked at here on this Ford transaxle that is used in the 2016 and above Toyota Prius. It's not exactly the same housing, but it's the same parallel motor design that Ford has used since 2005 in the Escape, in the first generation Fusion, the second generation Fusion, a few Mercury uh, variants and Mazda variants also. But this is the first time for a Toyota to use this parallel axis design. On the right, you can see the two electric motors. The larger one is the what they call MG2 that moves the vehicle down the road, and the smaller one is the MG1 that starts the engine and uh, recharges the high voltage battery. So it, you may chuckle, you may get a kick out of that, that the Toyota, latest Toyota design is remarkably similar to the design that Ford's been using for the last 12, 13 uh, model years. You also may get a chuckle out of the new 2017 Chrysler Pacifica minivan. It also uses the same <laughs> parallel axis design, two electric motors offset of each other. There's some advantages to this. Uh, typically the case is a little bit narrower than the inline axis design that all Toyotas used up to this point. And it can be a little lighter weight than the previous design inline axis uh, hybrids. But anyway, let's, uh, let's get back to the Ford uh, transaxle here. I've got the bell housing side of the case right here with the uh, generator electric motor rotor. This is called the rotor and the stator is in the case over here. And then this is our motor, uh, traction motor that moves the vehicle down the road. And it's called a rotor also as far as electric motors are concerned. Uh, while we are here to help us understand what the stators do, I've got a little experiment I want to show you. Um, I have a permanent magnet out of a previous uh, or an early design uh, Toyota hybrid rotor, one of these rotors here, a permanent magnet, a very strong permanent magnet. And if you look at this traction motor here, each of these black lines that I've drawn on the rotor laminated plates here uh, represents a change in a magnetic pole. So a magnet has a north and a south pole. This rotor is full of magnets and we have eight different uh, changes of north to south magnetic fields here in this, in this rotor and in, in this rotor here. So watch what happens as I take the flat magnet, I'll just keep it in my hand right here, bring it up close to the rotor. Notice I can drag that rotor around with this magnet, but even more interesting, watch this. If I try to turn the rotor, it's really hard to turn, and then all of a sudden it lines itself up again. I turn it again, lines itself up, and again lines itself up. Now if I take this flat magnet here and I just turn it around, Notice that it made the rotor move. So the stator assemblies in the transaxle here have an electromagnetic field that's controlled by the inverter assembly that I have a separate video on. And that inverter assembly is going to alternate the current through the stator, which causes its magnetic field to alternate. So it's the same idea as me flipping this magnet over. So let me do it several times here and watch the rotor. So I flip it over, rotor moves. Flip it over again, rotor moves. Every time I flip this magnet over, the rotor is moving. I'm not turning that rotor. The changing magnetic fields are turning the rotor. And that's an important concept to remember if you want to understand what the purpose of the stator windings are in the uh, transaxle that we're going to look at here in just a moment. Now, right below this electric motor, right down here, there's this little 
weird four bump cam lobe looking thing. That's called the resolver rotor. And the resolver is a speed sensor, a position sensor, and a direction of rotation sensor. And every one of these black lines, the vertical lines I've drawn here on this rotor, line up with either the top of the cam lobe, there's four cam, cam lobes, they either line up with the very tip of the cam lobe or the valley in between each cam lobe. So there are actually eight positions that can be monitored by the resolver. And the resolver is in this case here. But while we have the rotors here and the, and the gears, which I say, uh, which I told you I have a separate video on how the, the gear train works and power flow electrically, we need to synchronize the electromagnetic fields of the stator with the magnetic poles of the permanent magnets that are already inside of this rotor. And we do that by watching this cam lobe rotor resolver down there. And we need to synchronize the electromagnetic fields just perfectly with the magnets here on the rotor. And this is called a synchronous AC for alternating current motor. What neat, what's synchronous about it? Well, I just said, we have to synchronize the pulses of the external magnetic field, like that magnet I was showing you, with the magnets here in the rotor to make it rotate. All right, so let me get the, the gear portion out of the way here, uh, because we're not dealing with that here in this, in this video. So if we take if we come over here and take off this side cover, we will be able to see the stators that are inside of here. So let me get this side cover off. Before I take this side cover off, I want to show you the back side of this housing. So let's turn it. Oh, well, by the way, here on the front, we've got the coolant connections. We've got our shifter lever for park really is all it all it does engages the park pole we've got an electrical connection right here for connecting to the uh, inverter assembly and the rest of the vehicle but i'm going to keep that pushed in so we don't break it as we tip this thing over and then as we continue turning we have a vent at the top of the transmission we have the mechanical oil pump right down here with a filter that is not serviceable. There's no oil pan to drop off and change the filter, but there is a filter in there that eventually could plug up. Uh, this oil pump is driven off of a, a gear inside of here that on the input planetary gear set, there's an oil pump drive gear right here that turns with the crankshaft of the engine. So that's our engine driven oil pump. Uh, and then we've got the parking linkage over here. We've got our harness that comes in. We've got two temperature sensor connections that connect to the stators to measure how hot they are. And then these two white connectors here with the three wires a piece, those two white connectors there with the three wires a piece are what our stators connect to with three wires. And that's also what our big orange three-phase cables connected to on the outside of the transaxle uh, from the inverter assembly. We have the fluid fill plug right here, and there's a fluid level check plug in the back cover about this height right here. Now I'm going to tip this whole thing down. I've put some bolts in here so I don't damage any electrical connectors or anything, but we'll tip this down and take off that side cover. Okay, to take this side cover off and see the stators, I just have to take off the oil pump tubes here, the circulation lines. There's one, has a little wedge type piece of plastic and then a seal up inside of that pump. Got the line off got it disconnected from the the other side so now I've just temporarily put two bolts in holding the side cover on 
for this demonstration. So we'll take those out. There are two alignment dowels that hold this cover from just falling off and it keeps it aligned with the center line of the, the transaxle. There's a couple of pry points here. And we can lift off the cover with the pump. On the other side of the cover, you can see there's not much there. Other than if you follow these lubrication pipes right here, they're going to feed oil up the center of these two holes here to lubricate both of those rotors and the bearings and gears that connect to them. All right, this big piece right here is the stator assembly, all this copper wire and all these laminated iron uh, segments are, or is the stator assembly for the traction motor. And the traction motor, of course, is the bigger of the two motors I just showed you, the one that drives you down the road. The smaller one is for the motor generator, typically a generator, but it also is a starter motor that starts the internal combustion engine as needed. What looks like a big mass of copper wires here are actually three windings of copper wires that are connected together in the shape of a, the letter Y. I believe it's called a Y-wound stator, W-Y-E. That means with three electrical connections, we put power on one and ground on the other, one at a time, and this is DC that it's putting on here, it will run current through two of the three coils of wire at once. And then we alternate to a different two coils of wire and run current through them, DC current. And then we alternate again and run current through the next two coils of wire, the next unused one. So there's three combinations. Um, the, the windings are actually called uh, U, V, and W. And so V in the middle always stays the same on these hybrids. And then uh, U and W, we can change their polarity to make the electric motor turn the opposite direction. So we, we can have uh, U, V, we can have V, W, and we can have U, W. Those are all three of the combinations possible. And as we do that, we create alternating magnetic fields in the proper order so that this big electric motor here that we messed with before with the magnets will rotate in the proper direction with the proper amount of torque. Now what's cool about this is there we've got eight poles here. We have the equivalent of eight sets of magnets all repelling or attracting that electric motor uh, at a time to make it rotate. And typically on a hybrid, the magnet pulls the rotor around. It, it, it pulls it to make it rotate. Um, it doesn't push it. Um, as, far as, my re as far as my research is, has found. Um, if any of you know if I'm wrong there, put it in the, the comment box below. So we have to very carefully time the energization of the U, V, and W coils to make the electromagnetic field just such that that rotor, the traction motor, can move us down the road. And that's, that's pretty cool. Now, if we look deeper down inside of the stator, that round uh, piece right here down in the bottom, that is the resolver. And remember, the resolver is the speed sensor, the direction of rotation sensor, and the position sensor uh, for the rotors on the, on the transaxle. So each electric motor has a resolver to measure its uh, speed, direction, and, and location. You can see both of them down in there, uh, one in the small one, one in the, in the large one. Uh, electrically, as I mentioned before, we have a temperature sensor for each of these. The coolant, or these, these copper wires get really hot as we are running all this current through them, and they are cooled by the transmission fluid that goes in this transaxle. 
So whatever fluid your hybrid vehicle calls for, whether it's a Ford HF35 or the new 45 or whatever it may be, that fluid has to be the correct fluid because we don't want that fluid attacking the windings of these uh, coils of wire. Each of these individual windings here, if we zoom in, you can see that they're individual wires, individual little wires, but they are coated. They're electrically insulated from each other so that they don't short out and touch each other. Well, we don't want transmission fluid attacking that uh, coating and causing it to uh, short out. Uh, we don't want to run low on fluid on these transmissions because the fluid not only is a lubricant, but it keeps these cool. If these get too hot, they can get so hot that it can actually melt that insulation off the outside of these uh, little coils of wire and short them out also, just from low fluid. So if you've got a leak, or if you're not sure if your transmission fluid level uh, is correct, or even has the right fluid in it, uh, you're going to want to verify that. The only other electrical part in this transaxle is the internal mode switch. Uh, think of it as a position sensor for whether or not you selected park or reverse or drive or, or the B position for braking, for regenerative braking. So that tells the computer that's in charge of all of this. Uh, the TCM, I, I would imagine on this one, the transmission control module or the inverter assembly, which gear range uh, you have selected. Okay, so far all we have talked about is what happens when we energize the, the three-phase coils in the, in the transmission, the stators, and cause the electric motors, the electric motor rotors to spin. But that's only what happens during acceleration. When you decelerate, we no longer apply power to the stators. We don't put anything on them. We just shut them off. And instead, what happens is we have eight spinning magnetic fields on a rotor spinning inside of a coil of wire, three coils of wire. Those coils of wire have voltage induced on them. As long as they are connected to a load, there will be current going through them and it will create its own pulsating voltage with its own pulsating magnetic field. But that magnetic field is opposite of the magnetic field direction needed to allow this motor to turn as you decelerate, which means it makes it harder for the rotor to turn, which slows the vehicle through all the gears and, the, and your half shafts and tire, tire and wheel assemblies and slows the vehicle down. Okay. Uh, as you decelerate with that regenerative braking, then that electrical current that's induced on those stator windings goes back to the inverter assembly where it goes through a diode rectifier bridge, a full wave diode rectifier bridge where the AC voltage, the sine wave that is created or induced in these uh, stator windings is rectified to DC voltage, a bumpy DC voltage. And then inside the inverter, we have those three big smoothing capacitors in that one big black housing in the bottom of the inverter. Those smoothing capacitors smooth out all those, those bumps uh, created during deceleration and feed current back to the battery through that big reactor uh, coil of wire. And if the voltage was too high for the battery, then the reactor acts as a voltage drop uh, and drops the voltage down to whatever battery voltage is necessary to charge the battery. It's, it's not a very complicated electrical operation. Uh, if you think about it that way, what's complicated is you need to change the frequency when you're driving the vehicle to, to make the vehicle move. You've got to be changing how quickly do you apply voltage and current to the U, V, and W phases of those, those three windings to make it rotate faster or slower depending on whether you're accelerating or decelerating or accelerating rapidly or just cruising at a, at a somewhat steady speed. 
as far as these are concerned, they're, you're either accelerating or you're decelerating. There is no in between. You're not. There's never a steady state cruise. Uh, you're you're always really, really just slightly accelerating or slightly decelerating. But that is the electrical operation of the Ford HF35 hybrid transaxle. But not just this one, but but most hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles work very similarly if they use permanent magnet rotors. Now there's another motor design called an induction motor that Tesla uses that uh, General Motors has used in a few vehicles uh, and I'm sure there are others that use induction motors too and although that's a similar control uh, function how it actually makes the the motors rotate is a different story and we'll look at that in a few future episode. In an upcoming video, I'm going to go through in great detail the electrical operation with wiring diagrams, schematics, and so on, uh, detailing how all of this works electrically as far as driving the motors or the regenerative braking portion. I look forward to uh, discussing that with you at that time. Thank you for watching.